would have helped if I actually turned the microphone on. Hey, everybody, you should be able to hear me now. <laughs> kind of a rushed start this morning. But uh, just grabbed my cup of coffee right as the music track ended there. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. It's a nice, uh, well, I was going to say it's a nice sunny day here, but it just started raining. So have a sip of coffee and get the day going here. A couple things we're going to cover before we get into the actual making bit here. Somebody, CJ, from East Palestine. Actually, you're, um, there's a, a fellow near you. I think it's a master of nun leather. I believe he's East Palestine as well. I can't recall. I don't know if he's not far. But um, you had asked about my uh, crank splitter. And I actually got that on eBay for $400 shipped, which was remarkable. These things, they became very trendy over the past couple of years. Uh, and they routinely sell for like $800 to $1,000 in bad condition. But I got this one for 400 bucks from somebody who was closing out their leather shop. And it works great with a caveat. It works great for its intended purpose. And this is where people kind of get hung up. You get a lot of guys like me doing, you know, working in wallet weight stuff. And... They get these crank splitters thinking that it's going to help them, you know, split to wallet weight th thickness, you know, one ounce, two ounce, and things like that. And that is not what they're made to do. Certain ones can, I believe specifically the Landis uh, crank splitters, their gearing is tight enough to where they can most of the time get down that thin. But this one here is an American LS440, a six inch crank splitter. And uh, I... I I would rotate the camera to look at it, but I'm on a new mount, and everything's kind of just the way it is, so I'm not going to change the camera. But if you look at one of my other videos of my shop tour, there's a, there a, a good clip of it there. And um, every year I debate that I'm going to sell the thing, just because it has such a limited use case. And every year I think, ah, oh, I could get, I could easily get double, maybe even triple for what I put in it, because I, I fully restored it and repainted it and everything. And then I'll be thinking of that, and it'll come along a time where... I will need to do something that only that machine can do. And so it, it, it kind of earns its place here in the shop about every year or so, because I'll, I'll come across where I just have to split some heavy weight bridle or heavy veg tan and something like that. And that machine, it is designed to do that. It is made for that. That's a shoemaking machine. So it is basically made to split very, very heavy weight uh, leather down into still pretty heavy weight leather down to like six to eight ounces. And it, it excels at that. I've modified mine by expanding the size of the rollers uh, with by wrapping them in duct tape so that it will actually feed thinner weight leather. So I can get it to where it will pretty re reliably split 4-ounce bridle to 2-ounce bridle, which is the weight I usually work with. Something I've been meaning to experiment now with is uh, printing a new set of gears for it so that I don't have to uh, modify the roller. I can actually close the gears up tighter. Because that's the limitation on this machine, is there's only so tight the rollers can get before the gears start to collide with one another and they just crunch and they don't go any tighter than that. And like I said, the Landis, I believe, is geared a little bit differently, so it's able to get into those very, very thin weights and, and feed that kind of leather by default. This machine does not. Um, we'll catch up a little bit here. This is um, the first real stream... Uh, last week was kind of a, a test open. I didn't really advertise it anywhere. Or I didn't put it on my social media or anything like that, but I, I did for this one. I think I've more or less worked out the uh, the kinks in it, and I think we're good to go. I want to do this every Monday at about this time, mostly just to kind of keep myself uh, aware of what day it is on, on, on the week. It's nice to have a routine for something. But last Monday, we started making uh, this wallet, and this was the orange, orange and black Botero double-sided card wallet. I was working on. I, I took the liberty of finishing it up over the week. You can kind of see there. You remember we we put the uh, the pieces of black in the center there. That's how that ends up with with that. You can see that black stripe down the center there. That's what those pieces do for this. They kind of give that the accent line down the middle of that. So this is how this one turned out. I'm pretty happy with this. I think this is a good design. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple more of these and get these listed uh, on a made to order basis on my on my website here. Uh, while I was doing that, I, I worked on a couple other things, too. The same pattern. I've had this uh, lizard skin sitting around for a while. Uh, this was given to me, friend in Korea, uh, Mike Bulsay. And Mike, forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I, I don't speak too much Korean. But this is a, a, a dyed blue 
and a feather-edged blue effect on the outside of the lizard skin there. This is the same pattern, full, uh, full lizard skin uh, double-sided card holder, and it's a little hard. My camera's washing it out a little bit. There's just a little too much highlight on there, but if you look on my website, this one's available for sale. You can just barely make it out there. But if you look very closely, you can see on the edges, I did kind of a transitional faded paint effect to kind of match this here. So it's white in the center, and it transitions to, uh, to blue out on the edges there. So it's pretty hard to see with this camera here. There's that one. I'm going to move my coffee here. I'm getting a little nervous holding my wallets over top of my cup of coffee. Now this is one I was working on over the weekend. This is part of a custom commission for, for Martin. Martin, if you're watching, here's your card wallet. This was done with a full grass green glazed alligator from American Tanning. And again, it's a double-sided card wallet, but this one, he specifically requested straight lines, angled corners, and a very, very deep scallop on the front edge there. So I don't usually do this kind of design, but when, you know, when asked for it, I uh, was happy to do it there. And I get a feel for the... Uh, the scale pattern alignment on that, but I was very happy with this one. And it's unfortunate that the card will hide that nice little kind of keystone scale in the center there, but when it's empty, you can, you can get a feel for it. This one here is, um, this is fully alligator. And these two pieces here, these card slots, are lined with a whiskey botero, which you, you would never see, but you would certainly feel it when you went to put something in there. Put these away over here. And then uh, yesterday was a big day for uh, for Catholics. It was Palm Sunday. My, my godmother and my mother went to church at St. Anthony's in Youngstown. Very nice little small Italian Catholic church. I like to I like to go to their events. It's a it's a good place. But they go and get they get the palms, and they've been uh, this is a, a little thing that my family's been doing for I think over a hundred years now. My great grandfather taught my grandfather, and my grandfather taught them. And you take the palms and you, you fold them into, uh, the, they call these baskets, palm baskets. So we make one every year, and then you keep it in the house. It's kind of a, it's kind of a blessing. You throw the old one out at, at next Palm Sunday. So here is 2022's palm basket. I'm curious to see if anybody else had ever uh, seen these or done these, because as far as I know, I've never seen anyone else do them. It seemed to be a thing that just my family did. So if anybody else has any any perspective on this, I'd love to hear it. So I've, I'll replace my old one. This, these usually go in my workshop. Uh, it's tricky to find a good place for them because my cats really like them, as you can imagine. They're very interested in this, so it has to go up somewhere high. The first year we were in this house, we had the palm basket sitting down too low. And I remember him, uh, I caught a glimpse of Dima just sailing through the air in a perfect parabolic arc with this in his mouth, and we had to chase him around. And he loved it, but we were, we were less enthused by it. So, so this is... Uh, this is my, my palm basket for the year. This up on my shelf back there. I think my other one is still up there. Back there. Get into we'll get into the day's project. I took the liberty of starting this yesterday already. And get some of the boring stuff done. How long have I been a leather worker? As of February of this year, I've been doing it six years now. This is my first, my first year doing it on a full-time basis, so pretty excited about that. Thank you. That's that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. What we're doing here, this is another custom commission I was uh, I was requested to make. This gentleman had a very very clear vision for colors he wanted to use, which I admire greatly. Uh, I was skeptical that we were going to find an alligator of the color he wanted, but we did. And it is very, if you look on uh, the thumbnail for this screen, uh, that, is, uh, that is the color of the alligator. It's a pistachio green with this beautiful kind of pale pastel pink on the inside here. So yesterday, like I said, I, I took the liberty of um, getting a couple things ready. I made one of the sets of card slots already, just because it, um, you see one, you've seen them all, so we don't need to go through two of them. But what we're going to do today, we're going to make this. Uh, with the other pieces I cut out. So I've got them all cut out and skived and marked off and ready to go. But this is one of the sets of card slots here. And this is kind of how they go together. I haven't stitched or creased the inside edge yet. Uh, we'll do that later. 
but this is a six slot bifold so there's three card slots here and then behind this section here inside the wallet is what we call a uh, a hidden slot or a paper slot it holds uh, business cards receipts things like that anything you can you can fit in there um on these wallets i i, I fully align them so every part of the wallet is all lined with leather even the insides of these uh card slots here which is a little hard to show when it's put together but you'll see how we do that as we put it together so i'm going to set this aside for now and we're going to start with we'll get to um what this is made of here let's see i think i'm missing hold on let me let me sanity check myself real others let me check my garbage can Oh, we'll get to that. It'll turn up, probably. Oh, no. There it is. Glued to the top there. I thought I had lost this piece, but I forgot I had already gone through and, uh, and glued it. So, go figure. Crisis averted. But these card slots are made, on this particular case, I do them by a... Uh, taking a larger piece and folding it in half. And what that ends up doing, we get we get a couple benefits from that. Number one, we dress the top edge by having the, the leather folded over itself. So there's no need for painting or burnishing or things like that. The act of the fold itself is the dressing, and it makes it look nice and very nice and consistent there. You can kind of see down at the top there. So that's that's good. Oh, I and could you hear him back there? Hang on, let's see if I can grab him. He might let me pick him up. Okay. I'm gonna say hello. This is Sparrow. I was very surprised that none of them showed up last time. He might hop into the window and look at some birds. There he is. Hello. He is his own cat. He does not like to be held. I'm going to try him one more time. Nope. He says no. <laughs> his big brother will probably come down. That is one of the two shop cats. They come and go as they please. They might start to cause trouble. We'll see. See how it goes. But that's enough of that. Let's do some work. So there's a technique to folding these. I think I got distracted. The other, the second benefit, second benefit of this is that uh, when you fold it, you also align the back side of this. This is the back side. On wallets like this, I don't like to have them as just raw, unfinished leather. If it's vegetable tanned, I at least burnish it. But if it's chrome tanned like this, I can um, I can get it split down very thin to where I could fold it in half like this, and it's just a nicer, nicer finish to it. Even though you never see this, your fingertips would occasionally feel it. And again, like I said, the act of putting cards in and out, you feel the smoothness of it there. You notice I've got some lines drawn on this. I, I went ahead and did all that yesterday, to save some time. But these are these are guidelines for folding. This is the fold line itself, and this is the line where it ends. I don't fold it fully down to the very bottom of it. I, I stop about uh, half an inch short of it. And that makes it easier in that I don't need to skive anything down here. It just kind of makes a natural transitional step down. I only skive this top edge here just to further feather that line there. So we're going to do this. Got my trusty half a granite block. I used to have one granite block, and now I have two because I hammered it a little bit too much. But uh, I learned this uh, method from uh, Jim Guthrie, who I forget who he learned it from. But um, the real value of that line there is we're going to take some low-tack masking tape. Up there. I'm going to tape this down. And now I know that I can put all my glue up here and just fold right to this line, press it down, and then I have it exactly where I need it to be. So you'll, you'll see how that works here. Right now, 
I'm using just uh, the Sewa water-based glue. This is, again, my go-to glue for just about everything. Works especially well for liners, things like that. Now, I've noticed with the Chev like this, one application is not always enough because occasionally it will soak down into the fibers of the leather and you'll you'll kind of have difficulty getting a good bond. But so I'm going to put another second light skim coat over top of that. That should be plenty. And again, just eyeballing it, just looking at it. Because we've already measured all our lines. That line is already measured out. We don't need to do any measuring here. It's going to work. When you're doing this, work from the center out. Work from the center and work your way out. That way you push any glue that may have been you know, big globs or things like that. You push it out towards the center and it doesn't get stuck. Or you push it out towards the edges and it doesn't get stuck in the center. So that's down there. Now we're going to take our glass slicker. Going to put that down. Put that over. We're going to press from the other side. And there we go. So there's one of our card slots. You can see again, there's the back side there. This is now a fully lined, dressed, ready to go, more or less, card slot. We still have to crease it, but that's that's easy. Do the other two. Show that one again. And here's the other V slot. And these are shaped the way they are because these are the ones that are hidden beneath the other card slots. They're designed to um, taper towards the bottom there just to create less thickness at the edge. Down there. Please do feel free to ask any questions about this if there's anything that... that you're not able to see. I'm still kind of feeling my way around this camera setup, so if there's something that didn't get shown fully or you missed something, do please ask. Happy to answer any questions or any questions about anything. So good bit of glue there. Again. Down. Hey Johnny. Glad you could join us. that towards the middle and then push outwards now you may notice that you tend to when you're when you're really pushing it down like this you may get a little bit of a little bit of curve in it don't worry about that that doesn't come out during the creasing, it will come out when we lay it against the wall up there. So don't worry too much about the appearance of them being uneven like that. Now this one here, this you'll notice is a different shape. This is the outer card, card slot. So this is the one that's a square like that. There's no need to do any special shaping for that one. These ones are a little awkward because I usually keep the margins pretty narrow on these. So there's not a lot of room to get the tape down on it. Only about a eighth to a sixteenth of an inch there. This is um this is half a millimeter thick Chev from from Alran goat skin. This is a, a leather that responds particularly well to being split this thin and still holds a good bit of a Structural integrity. It comes in almost every color you could want. Easy to work with. Responds well to just about everything you could want to do with it. It is a um, it is a, a go-to standard for me. Uh, fine wallets like this. Really enjoy working with it. Bottom edge down like that. There. 
here. There we go. There's our card slots. Let's tape away. Can't do this without coffee. It's like the law. So now we have to crease these. I get the creaser warmed up. It does not take a lot of heat to crease these. On my creaser, I have it set to like 1, 1 1.5, so very low on the, the voltage on that. That usually evens out to around, I think, uh, Around like 100 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, so it doesn't take much. This weather is very, very easy to crease. It does not need much heat, very little pressure. It is just a, a good one to work with. So while we're waiting for that to warm up, there are a couple things we have to do, specifically with these two pieces here. Um, I have not made a full template for this yet, so I have to kind of do it manually. But you'll notice the way these lay together here on the edges, these all sit flush. And that's because there's a notch cut out on the edge there. We haven't done that yet on these. We're going to go ahead and get that done. Forgive me, I'm going to lean right in front of the camera here just because I really need to see it here. So bear with me. I'll try not to cover this up more than I absolutely have to, but on this one I do. I'm just going to take a white gel pen and mark the uh, cut margins for this, so where the edges are. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not good at waking up. I find that without some kind of caffeine, either tea or coffee, I, I really, uh, I really struggle. Got a little notch there. That's what we're doing right there. We're cutting that little notch, and that lets the next plot in line lay flat against it. Some people overlap these, some people do not. I've done both. My, my good friend Steve from Oak and Honey, we uh, kind of swapped the way we do this. He was doing it this way and I was doing it the overlap way and now I do it this way and he overlaps it and it's kind of, it comes down to personal preference and what you like. There are compelling arguments to be made either way of doing it which leads me to the conclusion that it just comes down to what you like to do. That one. Do it again for this one here. Looks like I already... This one. Out, I do. Good. Again, forgive me for getting in the way of the camera here. I won't be doing this much more often today. But this thing here, you just, you really do have to be right down on top of it to see it. I really need to, to modify my template or I don't have to do this anymore, but I keep forgetting to have that printed for me. Rather, laser cut. That'll be something to do this year. There we go. There's that done. By now, our creaser should be warmed up. This. We're going to test it first. Is it the scrap that we just cut? Working just right. We're going to start by creasing the back. Then we'll switch over to the front. I don't know how well that shows up on camera. That little decoration across the top adds quite a lot. I don't sell my templates because, believe it or not, there really is nothing special going on with this design here. This is nothing 
that couldn't be be uh, done by simply reverse engineering it, almost any other kind of wallet. There are very few. In fact, I would go as far as to say that there are no secrets when it comes to uh, designing wallets anymore. I encourage everybody to uh, take the time to learn how to do this themselves, if only because it um, it is freeing in this craft to be able to think, ah, uh, geez, I'd like to make something, and then you just design it yourself and do it. And it takes a lot of work to figure out how to do that. You'll, you'll make a lot, you make a lot of bad designs, far more bad designs than you will make good designs. But you have to get through those to be able to make the good ones. My first wallet, uh, it took me four attempts to make one that had margins that actually would fit cards in it. And that's just kind of the, the way it goes. You, you make a lot of ones that don't work until you make one that does. And then uh, that is how you learn the best way. You learn what works and what doesn't simply by doing it. All right. Now we're actually ready to start putting this together. So we've got our three card slots ready to go. Top, middle, our bottom. Again, you can kind of see how this starts to go together. There. Fit beneath that. There. And that's pretty much how they go together there. Are the templates asymmetrical? Shouldn't be. It may just be me, uh, the way I've cut them. If you're looking at the size of the wings, those uh, outside margins there are not part of the template. Those are just, I add them there for uh, extra trim allowance. So those there aren't actually measured. Warmed up down here. I thought it was going to be cooler today than it is. All right. So to glue these, there's a couple things we have to do yet. The surface has to be prepared for the glue. And I take uh, my scratch all, I just go in, scuff it up. Get in and try and pull up the fibers there. And what this, this backing piece here, it's called salpa. This is a, uh, basically a bonded leather sheet of, of leather scraps, leather trimmings and things like that that gets milled to a paste and flattened out. And this is very good for uh, liners, stiffeners, things like that. And I use this piece as a backing piece. The card slots actually get stitched to this piece. That allows me to glue the backing piece over top of it and hide stitch lines underneath there in the back so that when you reach in there, you don't feel any stitches. All of it is covered up. Bonded leather is kind of a, a dirty word, but all of it has a use. And the problem comes from it being, I hesitate to say misused, but it gets used very commonly on a inexpensive, you know, department store wallets and things like that. And I don't necessarily think that's a misuse. It, it is good for its intended purpose. It is meant to be an inexpensive wallet, and it works great for that. But uh, people here say, oh, you're using bonded leather for your wallets. They, they lose their mind not realizing that it all has a, a use and purpose. So we've got that scuffed up. Let's go ahead and get the back sides. Scuff it up here. Again, just taking the scratch all, getting in, scraping that down. And all this is doing is just pulling up some of the fibers of the leather and giving you a little more surface area for that glue to bond. That matters a lot. It matters a whole lot. Now, the glue I'm going to use for this is different than the glue I used for everything else. I'm actually going to use a contact glue for this. Scrape. Some people use razor blades, some people use sandpaper for this. I find that um, scratch all works best for me. Glue a stir. There we go. 
go. I agree with you there, Roger. It is often misrepresented in that, in that sense. Take our contact event. This is a Aqualeme 315. That one, the pronunciation of that one completely escapes me. Or someone will have something to say about that. Do. Apply. I'm going to apply it to all the card slot backs. Well, wait. Because this being a contact glue does need to be applied to both sides. Being, being shy about using glue here. This will save us just a little bit of time and that while we're stitching these down, these ones can be sitting there drying. I was thinking about, I actually meant to ask all of you, what uh, what topics do you think would be interesting to cover in a stream? I was thinking about doing yeah, an episode on burnishing, maybe one on edge painting, things like that. We'll get a little bit of edge painting in on this one here. Um, what, um, what are some topics that you guys would like to cover? What do you think you would like to see? If you have any thoughts on that, by all means, let me know in the chat. Or feel free to email me. Either way, it doesn't matter. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so we've got those set up. Let that glue tack up a little bit here. While we're waiting for that, I'm going to go ahead and thread my needles. I am of the uh, opinion that when you're getting ready to do a bunch of uh, runs of thread, for example, several card slots, things like that, I find it much easier to thread all your needles in advance. So in this case, I only need to do two of them, but I'm going to do them both now. And I find that it keeps, it preserves your mental flow as you're doing this to not have to stop, re-thread the needle. You just have one ready. The hidden stitch, that's a good one. Hey, thanks for the sub, Pedro. Product liability insurance for the small leathercraft business. I've actually thought about that a little bit. Um, are you talking about, you have to clarify for me, are you talking about liability insurance, I presume, for the seller, or are you talking about a kind of warranty for the product? Would you just clarify that one for me real quick? The hidden stitch is something I've, I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, we kind of discovered that, that it's kind of a funny story as to how that came about. We were in the Leathercraft Discord chat, which if you don't know about that, that is the place to be for learning uh, the finer details of this craft. If you, have any, if you have any questions about it, I'll try to put a link to that in chat for you. In fact, give me a second, I'll do that right now. Create an invite. But um, this, this is the place to be if you want, want to come in and talk to people directly about uh, finer details of, uh, of leatherworking. But go ahead and you can click on that there. This is a live chat with a lot of people hanging out, myself included. And all we do is talk about the finer details of leatherworking. But in any case, years and years ago, a fellow came in who learned that technique. And it was kind of unknown to most of us at the time. He posted a, a tutorial on how to do it. And then he got scared that he had given away too much information and he deleted it, but not before we had all learned it. So... <laughs> We, uh, I make it a point now to, uh, to try to teach that to as many people as I can, only because I, uh, I don't like the idea of, uh, of gatekeeping that kind of information. I think it's important to be open about it and to share it with everybody. Product liability insurance to protect you, the manufacturer. It, it's a good question because I don't think there's a whole lot that can go wrong with them. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot that can really 
hurt the end user that could come back to you. Um, it's not like getting in a car accident or things like that or something like that where you have some defect of the product injured you or harmed you. Uh, I haven't really thought of too many ways of that, but I, I am of the opinion that you should have. Should, uh, if, you're, if you're doing any kind of business, you should be protecting yourself under a limited liability corporation or something like that, which is funnily enough something I have to do this year. I've never done it before. I've just, I haven't been on a large enough basis to need one, but I think this year I do. But um, I think beyond that, I don't think there's a whole lot of consideration that needs to go into it for that end. But you never know. Business has strange circumstances. And I've certainly seen that. <laughs> you, you never know what can happen when, when people decide to uh, get angry about something. It looks like now we've got our glue pretty well tacked up. So, we're going to go ahead and stitch, stitch down the first card slot here. And what's nice about this template here, if you look at it, you can kind of see, here's how I kind of arrange things here. My template has all these lines worked out on it that I then transfer to the leather on the outside margins. You see the little lines on the outside edges there? These are where the top edges of the card slots go. And this is on the outside margin that gets trimmed away. These down here are cutouts that I've made in the template for where the uh, bottoms of the cards so let's go so I know where to scuff. So I never have to measure anything. I just know where all my stuff lines up. With holsters, definitely. With holsters, you would absolutely need to. I made one holster, and um, that was enough for me to know it's not something I want to mess with in the future. Uh, there's a whole lot that goes into that, and somebody you would be able to ask about that, the, uh, my good friend Jason Paris, who specializes in the ParisLeatherworks.com. He does a lot of them. There is a whole art form to designing and making holsters that is above and beyond anything I understand. And that's even coming from somebody who uses holsters a lot and has for a long time. I've been a concealed carry holder for 14 years now. So I know how they work. I know what needs to what they need to do. And even then, being fairly intimately familiar with them, it's still, they're hard to design. They're hard to make well. Uh, I, I certainly learned my lesson with that. One was enough. I'll, I'll never do it again. I leave that to people who, who focus on it. But uh, if you're doing something like that with holsters or anything like that, the deadly weapon, you absolutely would need to consider that. Me, with wallets, like I said, there's not a whole lot for me to worry about with that, which is a, a blessing. There we go there. So the nice thing about this contact glue is basically an instant bond. That's it. It's ready to go. We can go ahead and hammer our stitch holes. Get that stitched. Grab my stitching pony. Now, I'm not going to bother, um, when I do a longer stitch run, I'll adjust this camera face me, but for now, I'm just going to leave it where it's at. I'll probably just turn this screen, this screen over here on the on the bottom left to face me. So for, forgive me for going out of shot on the main camera there, but that'll only be for a minute. Like I said, when I do a, a bigger stitch run, I'll move it then. I still haven't quite got this uh, camera mount here the way I want it to in terms of easily moving it up and down. But we're getting there. And we're just going to do real quick here. Nothing really special or pretty needed here. Get that bottom the card slot stitched down. If I were ever to buy a sewing machine, I would definitely like to use it for this because you lose a fair bit of time doing a bunch of these. But even then, realistically speaking, it is not that time-consuming to do. And all of these stitches are hidden, so you don't need to be too pretty with them. They just need to be functional. That was, a, that was an astute point about the holsters. I forgot entirely about that. I tend to focus on purely my own narrow window of what I do here. Thank you for that, uh, Bruce. That was a that was a very good point. Or uh, Mr. Engelhard as, as well. Forgive me. <laughs> good question and a good counterpoint. The 
the hidden stitch, going back to that, I'll try to show you on this, uh, again, my camera rig is not going to be ideally set up to do that, but I'll, I'll show you. I'll do it twice here. Stitch both inside edges of these uh, hard slot banks here. I'll try to show you that today. I'll at least walk you through it. And there is a short video with no with no narration or explanation whatsoever on my, my YouTube channel from a couple years ago. I keep saying how I mean to uh, do a more in-depth video of that. And I'll get around to it. We'll get there. The bottom. Pushed up. Gonna do a basic back stitch here. No need to be special about it. Yeah, it just needs to be here. Even though I'm using polyester thread, I like to uh, glue it. I glue my ends in. I, I almost never end up having to wax the thread. It's already waxed enough to where it, it works well. Um, if I'm going through something exceptionally thick, which I don't often do, I'll sometimes run it through a bit of paraffin. But in most cases, there's really not much need to do that. At least in, in what I do. There, so we've got that. So with the glue still fresh, we're going to take this and we're going to hammer this down. By doing that, we pull the glue into the into the stitch hole and then hammer it closed so it tightens around it. Um, try this on your own. Go ahead and, and try doing just a, you know gluing your thread in and let it set and come back in an hour or so and try picking it out with your awl and you'll be you'll be surprised at how strong that actually is. That is a very strong joint there, even for how little little length there is to actually uh, grip it there. Most thread already does. This is Venomo number 8, so this one is pre-waxed already. I don't find much need to add any more to it, but like I said, occasionally, um, if going through a lot of alligator for like multiple pieces of alligator, things like that, it helps sometimes uh, to have that extra lubrication on it. And one thing with having cats, I'm going to take my snipped piece of thread and throw them away immediately. I try not to accumulate any of this. Cats like thread, and it is not healthy for them. If you have kitties around, you want to make sure you pick that up immediately. And then same thing with the needles. I'm going to stow those as well, just in the off chance that I get up and a big boy comes around and decides he wants to be curious about my workbench. So there's the first card slot down. We're going to go ahead and put the next one in over top of it. And to do that, as we do that, I put a card in each preceding card slot. So we get a little bit of extra depth behind there to kind of account for the fact that um, if you glue all these flat, you'll end up having it be very tight towards the front of the, of the wallet if you're putting cards in the back. This way you kind of account for that extra width in there, so at least one card in each slot is already accounted for to where when you fill the wallet up as intended, it's got a, you know, plenty of room and it's easy to use that way. I was looking at some workmen down the street at my aunt's house. She was having anything done. Go ahead and add our glue to this piece here. We don't need to do it for the card slot because we already did that. I forget who I picked that trick up from. I think it might have been Leatherbound Ink, Silas. I can't recall. I can't recall who told me about that one. But yeah, it is a is definitely a good idea. I'm gonna let this glue dry for a second, so I'm gonna put the Be Right Back screen on. I'll be back in about a, a minute. I'm gonna grab a drink of water and let this glue sit up. So be right back.
All right. Back. Had to uh, plug in my wireless mouse because I had never charged it. Uh, <laughs> it stopped working on me. Not usually used to wireless stuff. Learning my way around that here, so. Space for my water glass here. The only, as much as I like having this computer down here, the only problem I've learned is that um, I need to uh, optimize my usage of space a little bit better. As far as lining T slots go, the biggest thing with that, again, in my experience, is having the template guide you. If you look on here, you can see these top lines here. I mark it all out with that. And that's kind of how I know where to line everything up. But as far as actually physically lining them up, the best thing I can say is, um, you, the glue you use matters with that. And I like, I generally don't like to use this contact, this instant bond. But the reason being that I like having a little bit of wiggle room to really push them up snugly. And you still get a little bit of that. It's not a truly 100%, you know, like that instant bond with the contact cement. You get a little bit of room to do that. But what you want to do, you want to really work on pushing them up and pushing them snugly until that glue sets. And if you have to, if you have to do, you know, each side one at a time to do that, you know, whatever you've got to do to make sure that you get those snug, it, it comes down to really paying attention to it and forcing it up. So we'll, we'll do that here. Hello, Michael. A pleasure to see you, my friend. Taking that, pushing that up nice and snug right there. Do the next one. So not even worried about the bottom here, just kind of leaving that floating there. We're just pushing upwards, pushing in this direction to try to snug those together. And you can even take your glass slicker, push that down. That there we ended up with pretty, pretty snug. Now if you look closely, I mean, you can see a teeny tiny little gap, but you're looking at it without the benefit of having any thread any stitches, any creases, things like that, and all of those serve to direct your eye away from any possible little gaps there. So these here, once the wall is all together, you'll never see them. Now with that, we can lay that flat, push the bottom down there. Now we have our next card slot set up there. Eventful day down the street. I have the great fortune of living on a street where pretty much all of my family lives there, too. So I'm looking up the street, and there's my godmother, my parents, my brother. My neighbors on the left there are basically my family. My neighbors on the right are basically my family. My neighbors across the street are basically family. So we all kind of have this communal living here, and I'm watching them doing something on my aunt's roof, and I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> well, I guess better them than me. So... Hey, Steve, thanks for the sub. Go ahead and punch the holes for this. I made that little uh, engine telegraph thing over the weekend. I like being extra and having all of the stuff there. If you want to send me donuts and have them arrive on stream, I will wait until they get here. I will stream as long as it takes to receive donuts again. It was very it was comical. My birthday was uh, last month, and I, I came downstairs and looked on my front step, and there was a dozen donuts there, simply from Mike. And I know like five Mikes who know my address and could have sent them to me. And I basically went through the list, and Mike Attard was the last one I suspected because he lives across an ocean from me. And, um... As it happens, the last person I expected to send me donuts, it was him. He had done that. So it is uh, remarkable to live in a day and age where you can send uh, transatlantic donuts to people. Uh, quite remarkable that we get to do that. There, and again, for anybody joining new, I'm not going to adjust the camera just yet. We'll do that for the longer run. For this one, we're just going to do it on the little side camera. Stitch the bottom of this down.
as I forgot to describe what we were actually doing. I I was better at that last time. The stream thing, it's been a long time since I did it, so I'm trying to find my, my footing again. But, but I enjoy it. I, uh, I go through uh, high and low periods with doing this to where I... High periods where it's all I want to do, and low periods where I struggle to find the motivation. And it's funny that in the low periods, I often find that streaming helps a lot to motivate myself to do it. There's something about talking about it that just makes it a little easier to... Uh, find the motivation to do it. I don't know why that is. I'm not going to question that either. I used to do this on Instagram Live, which was suboptimal. We're limited to only an hour, so I would occasionally go for like three, four hours of streaming and have to restart it all the time. You have a keen eye, Silver. Yes, they are. These are from Leatherwork School, from Alan Valentine and uh, Jun Lin. Uh, they are... Uh, Pretty much what I use exclusively now. I used to use KS Blade Punch, and those work great. I uh, certainly like them. But um, Ellen was was listing these, and I was like, oh, I'll try that because I've dealt with both of them independently. Both Ellen and Jim Linner are great, uh, great people to deal with, and uh, I love them. I think they're fantastic for for the price point. You get to be able to have a set of three irons, you know, the ten tine, the five tine, and the two tine for like 180 bucks. I think it was. I can't remember. But it was very hard to argue with the price, especially for the quality of them. I mean, they, they are fantastic. Uh, like I said, I, they they pretty much, they're all I use. I'm one of the few people, I think, who actually needs one of these, one of the five tines. Most people can get away with just a ten and a two. But um, on some of my curves that I do, they're a little tighter, and the five tine is, is important to have. So I'm using the three millimeter set. That's... um. Nine stitches per inch, I think. Let me. Yeah, I think it. I think it's nine. I think it's nine stitches per inch. No, that can't be right. Is it? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is nine stitches per inch. Yeah. Um, the Kevin Lee basic punches are good. I. It's kind of ironic. I'm quoted on Kevin Lee's website. And I don't actually own any of Kevin Lee's tools. I just know them by reputation. Somebody asked me, it's like, hey, what do you think of Kevin Lee's tools? I'm like, they're they're the best, they're the best for the buck, you know, at the time, because that was what everybody was getting. And I, I had heard everybody's glowing reviews of them. And I ended up on the website, and again, I don't own any of any of his tools. But I, I continue to hear nothing but good things about him, especially his basic line. Two and a half mil or two and a quarter is good for watch straps. That's something I, I haven't got the patience for. I've made one of them, and I kind of decided, eh, it's not really for me. I don't wear watches. I never have. So the, the requirements for what a watch strap should be and how it should work are kind of unknown to me. So it makes it a little difficult to design them. Yeah, I, uh, I think these are fantastic irons. And again, at the price point even better. All right. Off. What I'm using here, this is a cobbler's hammer I got from uh, the one and only Ben Geisler. He had a special one for me. This was Rex's. Bomber's hammer, but he takes them vintage ones, and uh, you can see my reflection in there. Mine's a little sullied up from some glue on it there, but um, takes them and mirror polishes them. So these are excellent for hammering stitches, hammering leather down to glue. It is it is wonderful. I, I've messed with it a little bit um, with uh, sharpening and stropping irons. I find very little need to do it, at least with the ones I have, like the KS Blade Punch. Uh, those seem to be pretty good. Uh, I'm at, I actually am at the point where I do think I need to sharpen my KS Blade Punch because I use them for like three years straight, like continuously. So I think those probably could use it. These ones are about eight months old now, I think. So they certainly don't need it. They're, they're sharp as the day they were made. I have another set. I put them...
Pardon me for a second. I gotta blow my nose. Hold tight. Sorry about that. Lovely living in Northeast Ohio. Sinuses galore. I have another set of irons that I had. I don't know where I put them. I, I do know. Yeah, here they are. These were... These were the first set of pricking irons I ever bought that were not handy craft tool. The diamond chisels. I bought these. These were, um... These are seven stitches per inch of so 3.85. But these were from an Etsy seller, uh, Muxi, M U X I. I think they're Korean. These were regarded pretty highly at the time. And I don't think they make them anymore. But these were really, really good chisels. These are still extremely sharp. They're about, um, I'd say they're about on par with the, the Jun Lins. The finish, the construction of them is not as, as refined, but they were very, very good, very. Very solid, sharp tools. If I had stuck with the seven stitches per inch, I would still be using these, but I dropped down to three to nine millimeter or nine stitches, three millimeter. So these were these were pretty neat. And then that's basically it. I've only ever used these, the KS blade, and now the the Jun Lin irons. But if you're on the fence about these, I, I highly recommend them. Very, very good tools. So now, what's next on this? You might think the next step is gluing this card slot, but it's actually not. What we're going to do now, with this card slot off, still having access to the back of this, we're going to go ahead and glue the backing on. Get, first of all, let me consolidate my tools a little bit here. I'm making a mess. I used to remember to do this regularly. I used to remember to clean up the, sh the, the workbench as I was working. I've kind of fallen out of that practice, and I think I'm paying for it now. Let me get some things out of the way here, try to make some more room for myself. Oh, yeah, I have it. I would, I would definitely get it. If you're looking to learn, it is a great resource for that. Outstanding resource. If you remind me later, I'll grab it. We'll, we'll take a look through it. But it has a, a couple of very, very good projects from, you know, beginner to more intermediate and advanced. And uh, the book is nicely detailed. It tells you how to do things. A lot of, a lot of good techniques in it. It is absolutely worth the money. There, there are a lot of worse ways you could spend money to learn leatherworking. I'll put it that way. Uh, is absolutely worth the asking price. And Ellen herself is just fantastic. Um, she actually uh, hangs out in that, that Discord link that I, I linked earlier. So it's very cool. If you have a question about her book, you can just ask her, and she'll answer, which is amazing. We are, we are blessed to have her as part of our community. All right. That should be... That should be enough things put away for now. Let me grab <clears throat> my throat is a little rough right now. I was uh I was up all night playing Sea of Thieves. I usually end up playing the captain's position, so there's a lot of orders to be shouted and given. My throat is a little tired this morning. So we're looking for a good piece to use for a liner. When you're looking for liner pieces, I oftentimes go for these outside edges, things like that. These inside parts, these are perfect. So you, you want to save those for using for the actual things you're going to see. A liner only really needs to be felt. You, never, you will never, ever see this back part of it unless you rip the wallet in half. You, consequently, you can get away with using some of these edge parts here that don't need to be seen, but they still need to be there. So I like to I like to make as much use of the hide as I can, especially with the prices that Chev is going for now. It's, uh, quite killer. We're going to take our template here. 
here. Yeah, Andrew, we were playing playing last night. Uh, you can look in the chat and see some of the exploits. There were some good uh, there were some good fights last night. Take that, and again, I'm just cutting around my template. About an eighth of an inch is generally all I need. I like to have about that extra space there for cut margins. Here and there, I do, Mike. I experiment with putting a little bit of piece of tape, uh, the, the reinforcement tape there on the stitch line, but I ultimately think that's moot because I think people overestimate the amount of force that's being applied to this stitch here. If you think about it, like these stitches here, you could worry a little bit more about them, but these are doubled up. There are two, there are two full finished pieces on this because it's folded over at the top. So you get the strength of both the, the front and the back of it. And that's, even for being half an inch thick there, you know, perforated, it's still pretty damn strong. And again, the force that's being put to it is not that much. I mean, you would ha you think about how many cards you would have to stack in there to actually really start to strain that. It's quite a lot. And if, you, if you're doing it that, that's the user's fault. You know, you should know better than to put eight cards in one card slot to, to break that. It's kind of obvious that it's not intended to do that. And I do find, that, like you said, uh, putting the liner over top of that helps with that. It, uh, you get a little bit extra reinforcement on the stitcher just from it being you know coated in glue helps it quite a bit at least i think take that and finish this here i'm going to go skive this real quick how i it didn't skive all the edges of the Let's see what i did edge be right back. Here. You're a cat. You're a cat. Hang on. You bad boy. There he is. Here's the big boy. Look at look at that big boy. This big boy knows that it's feeding time in an hour, but he's uh, ever the opportunist. So he thinks that if he comes down here an hour early, he gets something. I'm not going to. Look at that big head. Look at that big boy. Be a good cat or a bad cat? You gonna try to be a better cat? You gonna try to be a better cat? And I better put this up. All right. I've skived this on one side. Need to, uh, I think I need to sharpen my blade a little bit. But that's good enough for that. We're going to, uh, that's, we're going to go ahead and glue this down here. And I like to do this before I glue the outer cards on, just because it lets me get a, straighter press down on these parts in here, and I get a little bit there. Lewis, it, it was the same uh, situation with me. I was never a cat person either, and uh, we rescued those two. We found them as kittens. Somebody had abandoned them at the lake, and my wife has always been a cat person. She knew that I wasn't, so she was very, very happy when I said, all right, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep them both. They're just too cute. Uh, seven years later, I, I, I find that I'm very much a cat person, so it surprised me, and it, it Pleasantly surprised her. T 
He is a big boy. He's either 16 or 18 pounds. He's a big cat. That's a big boy. Blew out. I've just got a little piece of wax paper here just to try and keep it off of the uh, off the, the bench. I'm usually not too careful when it comes to gluing. Just because it's water-based, it wipes up easily. Another advantage to the water-based versus solvent-based, that if you make a mistake or you get something somewhere, if you're just messy in general like me, it's easy to resolve. Do that almost every time. Wipe that off a little bit on the back. That should be sufficient. I haven't added the, the find a cat donation button yet, but I think I might do that. <laughs> We did pretty good. We didn't get any glue on the back. Here. No. Perfect. Now we've covered up our stitches on the back. Perfect. Now, with that done, we can add this outer card slot. So now we can go ahead and put our glue around the perimeter here. Hear him. Hear him in the kitchen opening cabinets. Fully hour early. I got way more glue on that than. I think it might be off screen, but I just have a little paper towel that's damp that I just use to wipe the glue spreader off. There. I'm back for more, did you? He's looking up at me and just going, new. Or rather, squeak. Big squeaker. What are you doing down the street? Going down. They got that ladder. What are you doing. Go look at them. No. You're not going to believe this. He actually just growled. I've never heard him do that before. No. No growl. No growl needed. Want to go see him? Go we'll find him. Yeah, that blue I'm using there is uh, Aquilum. Aquilim, Aquilim, I don't know how to pronounce it. But that's the 315. And I, I find that works. Um, if, if I could use the Sable glue for absolutely everything, I would. It, it's my preferred glue. So for veg tan, things like that, it works very well. Um, but for chrome tan stuff, Saffiano, Chev, I find that this works a whole lot better. So like we did before, we're going to go ahead and put a card slot in each preceding slot. There, and then one in the one we just did. I'm going to have to tell my wife about that. I can't believe he... I've never heard him ever do that. Again, referring to lining up card slots, pushing that up. Making sure that's snug, and now we can work on the rest of it. Work the rest of the edges down. Take our glass slicker. Go 
And when you're moving the glass slicker again, you want to move it in the direction that you want to snug those. So if you push them this direction, you'll spread it out a little bit. You want to pull them together. You want to pull it up. This. Up and out to press it down. Same thing down here. Roll it down. There we go. Now, take these out. Have that nice and ready to go. And if you look at the card slots, you can kind of see, you can see the bow on the ones at the top there. We've added in that little bit of extra, extra length, make it easier to put cards in when these behind slots are filled up. Moment to remember which side we've done. Okay, so I did the right side yesterday. This is the left side. That means we're going to have to trim this inside edge. Now you can see on here, my guidelines from when I made the card slots are pretty well lined up. They're pretty good, but they're not perfect. So before we trim this again, we're gonna we're gonna lay the template back on it, retrace the line, make sure we've got a nice squared off line there to trim with. And again, with doing that, I'm just using just a basic. I thought this was a bic, but it's not. I'm actually almost gone through it. This is just a white gel pen. These work fantastic for marking leather in that um they leave a nice clear line, even on something very pale like this. And when you want to get rid of it, as long as it hasn't sat for a day or two, it'll wipe off with water. Sometimes if you have to go a little more aggressive, you have to dab it with water and a brush. But water removes it. And in most cases, if you do it right, all of it gets trimmed off anyway. So there's very, very little cleanup involved with it. I'm going to take this. Again, I might get, might get in front of the camera again. Forgive me if I do. It really just requires making sure it's lined up just right. Yep. Going to retrace our lines. Everything's together. Perfect. So let's clean that up a little bit, this edge. I'm going to take, this is just low-tack masking tape, purple stuff. It's a little more expensive, but it's nice for use on leather, again, because of the low-tack. You don't have as much risk of lifting the grain off which if you use some of the regular masking tape, it actually can do that, especially on veg tan. It, uh, it will pull grain off and loosen grain sometimes. So be careful. You generally don't want to lay this on anything that is actually going to be a finished piece of the wallet. You want to keep it on areas that are just going to be removed later. Hang on, razor. My razor mouse wants me to do something. There we go. I don't know why a mouse needs to come with its own software. Just don't get it. Maybe I'm getting old. Before we do that, I'm gonna hone my knife a little bit. And everybody laughs at me for doing this, but I actually do hone my uh, disposable razor blades. And I find that it makes a, a big difference. I really genuinely do. I know some of the Chef Knives boys are in here watching. They're probably reacting in horror to me using the little rod sharpener. But I do, and it works okay. I also don't subscribe to the marketing about RFID protection. There are... I know there are certain individuals I know. If, uh, if Jim Guthrie's here, I know he can explain it to the contrary, but I don't know. I just don't see the need to it to do it. So I'm, none of mine have ever bothered with it. Uh, apparently you can get it in very, very thin layers and put in the outside, but I, I kind of feel like that's not how they're stealing data these days. I think it's given much more willingly in most cases, but somebody who knows better could certainly uh, give a more educated take on that than me. 
in any case, I, funny enough, despite the prevalence of the marketing for it, I almost never have people asking for it. Um, maybe on one hand, I could count through the years I've done it, I have actually had people request it. And usually, it's not a sticking point with them. I tell me, oh, I've never really done it before. They say, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Here, what I'm looking at here, I want to, number one, I want to make sure that the card slots line up in the center, and they do. That looks, that looks smart. So we've got two identical pieces here, and I want to double check, see where my final stitch hole is punched, so that I don't end the stitch line higher or lower on this other side here. Take the wing dividers. there. Next thing we're looking for, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it here. We want to make sure, yeah, I think you can just catch it there. We want to make sure that the tines of the pricking irons are bridging and not piercing tops of the card slots. In this case, they are bridging it perfectly. So that way, when we go to make a, a stitch, we don't have one going through the top edge of the card slot. It, it, it straddles it and goes around it perfectly and looks nice and clean. Up. Oh. Go. Perfect. That's a pretty good idea, Kelp. Exactly. Yeah. You gotta get them from the right bridge. If you get it from the wrong bridge, they don't work. And then again, we're just gonna line these up real quick and make sure that I end same spot. Perfect. There we go. There we go. We have our two sets of holes ready to go. Try and keep the bench clean. So I'm going to put a couple things away that I don't need right away here. Knife. I know I do need the needle. Okay. Scraps here. And then before we stitch this, we're going to take the hammer and we're going to hammer these holes closed. I like to do this both before and after stitching. It generally matters more after stitching, but I, I find that it does help to do it before as well. You get a cleaner, tighter stitch from that. We're doing it that way. Now let's go ahead and thread some needles. Now this wallet... Let me get the let me get the alligator. Which I was about a foot taller. So this is what this is going to be paired with. This is called the pastel green from American Tannic. Pastel green glazed. And there was a bit of a decision making to be done yesterday. This is going to be stitched actually in uh, matching green around the perimeter, but after consulting with the customer we both we both agreed that uh, for this interior interior edge we're gonna use a matching pink and just keep the green on the perimeter. I generally like to keep all of the thread consistent. I don't usually do two different colors of thread, but in this case with these colors being what they are it made uh, it made better sense to keep this the same color on the inside and just have that around the perimeter. That's how we're going to do this. Put this alligator back. Yeah, this is going to be this is going to be a, a pretty pretty wild one. Like I said, the, the customer who commissioned this had a very clear vision, which I which I, I love. I love the vision, and I love it when people have a vision. It's very fun to get to suggest things to people, but it's I find it more fun when somebody comes to me and says, here's exactly what I want, can you do it?
So on this one here, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna move the camera, so I'll, I'll go to a black screen for a second while I adjust that. That's getting an easier uh, way of changing that is something I haven't quite figured out yet, but we'll get that for the next one. Uh, I'm gonna try to show, or at least talk about the hidden back stitch, and we'll get two chances to do it here, one on each, one on each run here. It's easy to be too heavy-handed, but that could also be, uh, you know, is your, how smooth is the striking surface on your hammer? Is it, is it polished up nice and smooth? If not, that could be a cause of it, but, uh, you, you could definitely be too heavy-handed. Certain leathers are easier to mar than others. This Chev, even for as thin as it is, is it withstands hammering pretty well. It's hard to really visibly damage this stuff. At least, the uh, blunt force trauma. <laughs> Whereas a uh, veg sand like Batero, even though it's technically, in, in many ways, people would consider it stronger, uh, you can easily mar it, and, and it shows. That's kind of funny how that works out. Oh, there's one. Go here, and I'm, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take a quick break, uh, hit the head, grab some water. I'm going to adjust the camera. So we'll say, let's let's take five minutes here. I'm going to get things ready here. Then when we come back, we'll stitch the two interior runs on this. Free some. We'll talk about the hidden back stitch, and then we'll talk about painting a little bit, too. And I think we'll probably, we'll probably get these two ready, get these inside edges painted, and probably wrap it up there for the day, because I've been going for a good hour and a half now. Thank you for those who have been sticking around from the start. I think maybe we'll wrap it up with a, get some, further question and answer going on there if anybody has anything. And like I said, if you have any concepts that you would like to focus on a stream, any uh, particular things you'd like to see, I'm open to ideas for it. Um, as fun as it would be for me to simply just do the thing that I'm doing each, each Monday, I think people would benefit more from having a, a focused, here's the topic of discussion, here's how we do this thing. So if you have a, a question about how to do something or a technique you want to go in depth on, please do let me know. Either type it in the chat or send me an email. A couple people sent me emails, which I was, I was gratified to receive. and I was thrilled at that, so I'm glad that uh, glad that you guys had some ideas for that. Like I said, I'll be right back. Give me about five minutes. I'm just going to grab some water, get the camera set up, and we'll, we'll pick this up here, and we'll stitch these two, uh, these two lines here.
All right, I'm back. I'm just going to adjust the camera here real quick. Give me a moment. Oh, Lord. Should have given a warning about that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's see. Actually, it's not half bad. I wasn't sure how well that was going to show up, but that's not half bad. All right, good. You might actually get a pretty good... Uh, View of the way this is done here. We're gonna do the easier one first. And what determines which is the easier back stitch and which is not is where it ends. So because we're going in two different directions, one of the back stitches is going to be at the top, top of the card slots, and one's gonna be at the bottom. And the one at the bottom is easier because there's just a bit less to think about down there. Let's see, maybe. I don't know which I don't know which way. We'll figure it out here. In any case. So one thing I do, I like to do a double stitch at the top of each card slot. And I do that more for Aesthetics than anything else. Kind of a bizarre little hallmark of my stitching, I think. I don't know a lot of other people who do it that way. I just like it. I think I'm going to have to get higher def camera have it dedicated to being the stitching camera. Something to think about for the future. What you guys are actually seeing on your screen, I'm not sure how much you can actually see, the lighting being what it is, is the back side. I'll try to do one from the other side here in a moment. Next one. And, and to do that double stitch at the top, all I'm doing is I'm, rather than running through with both needles, you do your regular stitch as normal, and you take just one needle and go back through it, come out on the other end. That's how you do that, that double loop stitch at the top of each card. So, and I started doing that because I found that um, I was doing it back when I was staggering, rather layering card slots, like we talked about earlier, having one slightly on top of the other. And I found that even though my stitch line was straight and proper, looking at it from certain angles, it looked look janky. I found that um, having that extra thickness of the stitch at the top of each one mitigated that and made it look straight. And I, even though I'm not doing it that way anymore, I still do it with that uh, stitch just because I quite like the look of it. Cats are being fed right now. Being a little quieter than I would be normally. Uh, it is my pleasure. I'm glad you joined us for it. Like I said, I, I genuinely, I really enjoy talking about it. Glad that there are people who are interested in listening to me talk about it. I hope I'm able to uh, give some good insight on how this is done, and I hope I help you improve your craft. That I posted a link earlier to the Leathercraft Discord chat. Feel free to join. That is the place to be for discussing technique and getting you know, honest. The biggest thing is really getting honest critique about it. It's hard to self-critique sometimes because we're either overly harsh 
or we're overly generous to ourselves, and there doesn't seem to be really much in between. And more often than not, I find we're overly harsh to ourselves. So it's good to get uh, a third-party opinion, especially one that's actually knowledgeable about it, and that really is the, the true, I think, the, the best part of that, of that chat. I'm very proud of it. Here we go. Here we've come to the bottom. Again, I, I don't know how much of this you'll be able to see, but I'm, I'm sure going to try. So, with doing this type of hidden back stitch, I generally stop around three stitches from the end. What we're going to do, we're going to take, we're going to drop one, one thread and only do it with one needle. So rather than doing two needles, we're just using one. And you're basically going to convert from a saddle stitch to a running stitch. You're going to go, you're going to, you're going to skip and go through each hole with one stitch all the way through the back and then wrap wrap back around. So we're starting on the right side. We've come through the right. Now we're going to go, we're going to take that same needle, come in from the left. If we look here, get all the way to the bottom, I'll show you what I mean by a running stitch here. Skipped. Skipped a hole there with doing that. You can see that, that skipped hole at the back there? We're going to come back again with the same needle, and when we come through from the other direction, it'll fill in that hole. And that's kind of the concept of it there. You, you change from a saddle stitch to a running stitch, and it's the way you pull the thread up and down and the angle you insert and remove the needle determines the angle, the, the visual angle of that stitch. You basically are mimicking the look of a saddle stitch with a running stitch. Here. The door opening behind me means the cats have been fed. You may see one come prowling through. So again, coming back through the other direction there, you can see that we filled in that with another, another stitch there. Now it looks a bit messy right now, but just keep the faith. They don't look truly good until you hammer them flat. We've got that there. So now it's time to actually end the stitch. See there, we've got we've got our thread both on the same side now. Our last real saddle stitch. We're going to pick that out a little bit. We're going to pick out a little, a little loop of it there. Form a little knot here on this side, and form another knot on the other side. So we're pushing needle through the loop there, where we now have it. Like that. I'm going to take a bit of glue. Some people melt the thread in. Some people push it through the edge. I prefer to actually just glue the thread in place. Let's see a little bit. Delaminate it a little bit from the hammering. Work with it. Too. While you're stitching, you should also be testing your edge if you've got layers of it. You know, go feel free to pick at it, try to pull it apart. And if you can pull pull it apart at all while you're stitching it, now is the time to work glue back in there and glue it back flat. Now we're gonna pull this tight. And when you're pulling it tight, you want to kind of do it each side individually. Kind of really snug it in there. Snip it as close as you can. And on the visual side, the side that you can see, take your awl. Any hint of the end of the thread visible, poke it back in. And now, again, while that glue is fresh, get in there and hammer the hell out of it. Because again, you want to close that up while that glue is fresh. So now, trying to find the right angle for you here. Might not, might not be able to really show because the thread, the thread matches it so well. But our back stitch is actually down here. So these last three, technically four stitches, are all the back stitch. Little. There we go. That's better. You can actually see it there. 
So again, on this, where my thumb is, this is the back stitch here. Once we have it all creased up and painted, it'll be pretty much indistinguishable which side is the start and which side is the end. And that's the concept. That's why we call it the hidden back stitch, because you cannot see where the where the thread actually ends. So that was a lot to take in. We're going to do it again on the other side. You'll get another chance to see it, this time going in the opposite direction. It's one side there. Like I said, what we're going to do, we're going to stitch this other side, we're going to crease both of them, and we'll do some edge painting. I think we'll wrap it up with that. I think it's a good, good length of time for a, a stream. And starting again, and this time we're going in the opposite direction. I'm going to try and let me shift my seat here a little bit, see if I can't show you from the other side here. Oh, no, that light is... Oh, no dice. Yeah, it's just too, too bright. Oh, well. So be it. <laughs> the stitching pony is, uh, I made it about a month into, uh, learning how to do leatherworking six years ago. I made it from scrap wood. And yeah, it's just a carriage bolt and a wing nut. But my, my dance, my stitching dance, has kind of grown around that wing nut to where I, I generally, I catch it sometimes, but I really don't catch it too often at all. I've looked at buying some really expensive, nice stitching ponies, but I just can't bring myself to do it because this one, just, despite being fairly primitive, well, despite being very primitive, it works just fine, and I can't bring myself to spend the money to replace something that I'm very used to and is working A-OK -okay for me. And on a short run like this, where there really isn't that much length to the thread, it never, uh, well, almost never catches it. Well, Silver, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you were able to catch this one. Like I said, I'm, I'm looking to do this every Monday at this time, mostly just to give myself the routine of it. I'm glad that uh, other people happen to find that beneficial. It's very convenient that YouTube records and uploads it automatically, so... That makes it very handy. We're up into the card slots now, so we're almost ready to do another backstitch here. Okay, here we go. From the top, show you. A little hard to spot there, but you can see where we stopped there. We stopped three stitching holes from the end. That's where our, our back stitch is going to be. We're going to take, we're going to use this one here. You can use either, I stitch from the, the right side at the start and I stitch away from myself, which seems to be backwards from how most people do it. So don't take my method of doing it too literally in terms of which side I start with and which side I finish with. The, over, the general concept is what you want to focus on here. So one, one needle. Through from the right. Back through from the left. I think they do sell a 20 tooth. Here. 
you look closely, you can see where I've skipped that stitching hole. That's the result of the running stitch there. So now, with this being at the top edge, where we do our double loop, we actually have to come back through here again, recreate that double, that double loop there. So we're going to do it one more time through there. Back through the same hole. We create our double stitch at the top there. Now we come back and we're going to fill in that empty stitch hole. And you'll notice as I'm doing this, I'm using my finger to kind of guide thread. That's very important to do. Because when you're only using one thread and there's nothing else in the hole, it doesn't have that natural um, friction from the other side of the, of the thread to help it align and do the, the nice angle. So you need to manually create that angle. So you need to very positively be pushing up, pulling down, things like that as you're making this, this running stitch to recreate visually the angles of the slanted saddle stitch because it will not do it on its own. You have to, you have to make it do that. So we're getting ready to finish it now, so we're going to pick out the last saddle stitch. That little loop there. Form a knot there. Pull it through. Form a knot there. We have it like that. I don't own a 20 tooth. I think they're kind of a crutch. But then again, I'd probably love one if I had one. So. <laughs> Putting some glue on both sides and then pulling it tight. Want to get that glue squeezing out of the hole a little bit. Right. Taking the all a little bit of the visible visible end of the thread poking through. Just push that back into the hole. Take it while it's soft. All right. Give me a second. I'm going to go to black screen. I'm going to put the camera back down, so bear with me for a moment. I'll be right back. Put the camera back the way it belongs. There we go. Perfect. Should be able to see there. There's our. Here's our back stitch here. This one. Here's our back stitch up here. And that takes a fair bit of practice to be able to do right. But it's worth learning because again, it kind of frees you from having to worry about hiding or working into the design the uh, the double back stitch. Is um is a very very good technique. And it really, it, it looks complicated, but it really is not once you kind of figure out how it's done. The hardest part of it is actually getting the angles of the stitch correct and learning how to move your fingers and how to move the thread where it replicates the angled slant of the saddle stitch without actually doing it. It goes away. Right, we're ready to crease here. Okay, all right. Pull down, Modus. We're going to start again as usual with the back side. There's a couple of reasons for starting with the back. With the particular creasing tip I'm using, 
R2 for mason creaser. It has a nice rounded profile to it. So a lot of times we get away with on veg tan and things like that, some things that you would normally bevel that are too thin to easily bevel with a beveling tool. You can effectively do that with just the creaser. So we start on the back side and it rounds the back, gives you a nice profile there. Uh, the other thing that it helps with is that this creaser uh, does not have perfect temperature regulation. So if it sits for a while, like mine has, the temperature can creep up on you. So you don't want to start on something that is going to be very visible and have it be a little bit too warm and end up burning it. If you're going to, if you're going to have to do that, you might as well do it on something that is invisible and not seen. So you kind of avoid uh, that problem as well by starting on the back side. And then you, you can very quickly identify if it's too hot or not hot enough, if something crazy has happened, if it's broken or things like that. You identify that on an area that is not visible rather than one that is going to be directly in your face. So now knowing that that's good, we're going to go back to the front. You remember how I mentioned um, earlier that we were looking at the we were looking at it naked. There were no stitches, there were no creases, things like that. I find that things don't look complete until there's a crease, and the crease really does do a lot. If there's any little minor variations or things like that, if for example you have small gaps here, all of that disappears with the stitches and the creasing and the edge paint. All all of that draws your eye away from any minor small defects that you're that you can notice. When there's nothing else there to see and you get your eye up on it, you can see it. But with everything else, with the whole complete picture of it, it looks perfect. I'm, I'm, couldn't be any happier with that, Frank. That looks fantastic. Come on now, here we go. I'm, I'm pretty darn happy with that. That looks, that looks quite smart. Do it for the other one here. Back side first. Yeah. What are you doing, buddy? Disinterested. Perfect. Did notice you have to trim this a little bit. I must have stretched it. Give me a minute to get in the camera frame here. Together now. lines up just right. Everything looks nice and smart. Now, the last thing to do with these, have them all done. Everything's lined in the back. Our stitches are all in place. These are two complete card slots. They're banks of card slots, except for this edge must be dressed. We're going to do that with paint. This is, <laughs> this is something where I, I uh, I do this very differently from most people in that I like to do it with my fingers directly. Uh, and everybody laughs at this. And it's certainly very fair. But I find that I get the most control this way, and I like doing it this way. So you're gonna you're gonna watch me finger paint today. And I know the fellows from the Leathercraft chat are gonna roundly make fun of me for it. But I I willingly accept it. Before we do that, we're just gonna hit these with a sanding block real quick. And what this is doing. Any glue that may have seeped out, anything that may have popped out of that the edges there from the layers there, we're just going to knock that down real quick. And this is just a simple sanding block. This is 320 grit. Uh, that, that's my workhorse sanding grit. I use that for, for 
most of my sanding is done with that grit of sandpaper. Paint. Hey, who are you doing? Poke it off. Truly handmade, yes. <laughs> going to use... Uniters, Uniters, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So like the like the thread, the exterior edge is going to be green to match the uh, the alligator. But for this one here, we're going to use obviously the uh, pink to match the uh, shell. Probably can't see them back there on my wall, but I have the little, um, from Ikea, they're like three bucks. They're the little wall-mounted spice racks. They work great for holding edge paint, glues, things like that. Give that a good shake. Anytime you're edge painting, you want to have a damp towel handy. Doesn't need to be soaking wet, just damp. Because the water will pick up uh, any excess paint, things like that. Mistakes happen. So you want to be able to wipe that up immediately. If you let it dry, it's much, much harder to get rid of. Let's see. It's a little bit darker, but it's not going to matter for, for the very limited use that it's going to be. That's going to be okay. I'm debating if I want to. Let's try it here. See what this looks like. So generally when I'm finger painting, I just use, I shake it up good and I just get a little bit on, uh, from the cap. You want to get a bead of paint on your fingertip. Take it and run that bead down the edge like that. You're rocking your fingertip as you go. You're rocking the bead of paint onto the edge. There's our application of paint there. Other than a little bit at the very start, we actually have no excess. That's completely covered and done. No, no special tools, nothing needed for that. We'll do it again here. Again, just getting a big, good sized bead of paint. There we go. That's that. Obviously, that's a lot easier on an edge like this than one that's much thicker, but I find a little need to get more into it than that. I'm going to let these dry for a second here. We'll talk about... Talk about the rest of it. Now, we're not done painting it. That's our first layer. Contrary to, to what some will tell you, you don't need a lot of layers of edge paint to, to do this. We're going to do it here with one. Our first coat is kind of a medium thick coat. And what we're going to do next, we're going to actually melt that into the edge with our filatus, which is sitting over there hot and ready to go. A little Caesar's pizza. Once these dry up, we're going to go over that. And the heat does two things for us. It um, it melts the paint into the fibers of the leather, so you get a good, strong surface bond from that. It smooths them, smooths them out, so anything that's you know high spots, low spots, things like that, it spreads the paint around and, and fills it. So if you have minor gaps, things like that, most of the time you can fill that with a heated application of paint. And then when we go over back over that and block sand, we get a very hard firm edge on that, and that makes it easier to apply paint to it from there. Your first application of paint, the leather will actually soak up a fair bit of it, and it's hard to get a good, smooth application of it, so the heat helps a lot with that. 
You don't need heat to do it. You can certainly do it without it. It's just going to take a little bit longer to get that build up there. Um, if you can't get a good edge without heat, you still won't get a good one with heat. So the rest of the, uh, the finishing is, is just as critical. This just saves time. This does not necessarily make it better. Uh, I do think you do get a little more durability from it. I think you get better adhesion from the heat, but it is not strictly required. That said, I would certainly choose to do it with the heat rather than without it any, any day of the week. One thing we can do to kind of accelerate this is I have a space heater behind me. I'm just going to hold it over it for about a minute here. So I'm still here. I'm just holding this over the, uh, the space heater just to tack this up a little bit further. Some people use a dry booth. I think the space heater works just fine. In the summer months, when it gets a little drier and a little warmer, usually within about five minutes, uh, a, a coat like this will be, will be fully tacked up and ready to either sand or heat spread. Generally, a very thick coat I can usually sand within about half an hour. That works pretty well. These are almost ready. I'm going to give them another, another about 30 seconds over the space heater just to further tack them. Able to uh, to heat spread them here. Thought I heard a friend. In one section. Hey boy. So big. Get so big. How did you get so big? Tell everybody how you got to be such a big boy. Tell everyone how you got to be such a big fat kitty. He's not fat, he's just big. He's a big old boy. See, if you have a cat, it makes waiting for edge paint to dry a lot more entertaining. He's not notice how he's nice and serene now, he's been fed. He's interested, in, you know, he's interested in the outdoors again. Sparrow was on earlier, Chris. No more workmen. You can't see them. You can't growl at them anymore. You think that paint's dry? You think that paint dried? I think it probably did. I think we could probably get back to work. Get back to work. I think we probably should. All right, back to work. Let's do it. All right. Got the creaser ready to go. This is now tacked up and ready. If you look, let me see if I can show it shadow. I don't know if I'll be able to show it on the camera, but there is, even though we cut that flush, when the paint sinks into it, there is a little, uh, there, there is a little bit of a visible trough, a little bit of a valley in there. So this, uh, this is going to fill that in. Running it flat over the top. And after we do that, we're going to run back over it. On the 45s each side. That spreads any excess back over into the center. And a roll it around. Gentle curve over that. Smooth it back out. Do this for the next one. So Dima generally doesn't like to be picked up. He he doesn't mind it, but he doesn't like to be held for very long. Usually you can hold him for about a minute. And that's about it. He's very serene right now because he just ate. So he's uh he's in a very happy mood. Um I'm heating it by a fair amount. This is hot enough to burn you pretty good. 
I've hit it with a digital thermometer, and it's alternated between 300 and 600 degrees. I don't quite know how much it is uh, actually heating it there. I'll try to measure it again and see what we come up with here. Oh. Hang on one second. I'll be right back. Put on. All right, sorry about that. Let's see, I've got the digital thermometer right here. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining. Let's see if we can get a good reading from. That's around 350 to 400 degrees, according to this. Now it's it's a pretty shiny surface, so I don't know how accurate that really is, but it is it, it's hot. It is not it, it is hot enough to burn you pretty good. For reference on the the dial. I've got it set to uh, six, so it's 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 pretty hot. So, with that smoothed out, what we're going to do next? We're going to take our sanding block again and further screw that up, and again hit it on the flat, hit it on the forty-five. And what we've done with that, again, that is not our painted edge, that is our base for a painted edge. Now we know that we have all the, the valleys and peaks taken care of, they're all trued up, they're either filled or blocked down. The edge is firm, it's not porous anymore, there's a good surface that we've now sanded, so we know that our paint is going to stick to it, it's going to be very easy to apply the next layer, and now we can begin actually building up that dome shape. So I'm going to put a relatively thick coat on next, and that really will be the last of it. I think we'll probably stop work after that. Um, I'll answer any questions that you guys have. Any questions about anything you saw today or anything, again, that you'd like to see, please do post in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of we'll take a minute and answer that. So go ahead and um, hit me with what you got there. One final note for edge painting before I put the paint on there. I'm going to take my damp towel. I've sanded the edge. I'm going to tack the edge. and what. What that refers to, that's a painting term. We're just going to wipe it over gently with the damp cloth. And tacking refers to the act of removing dust, dirt. So if you look at the top, we remove that little bit of dust from that surface there. Uh, and when that's in your paint, you might not see it when the paint is liquid, but you will certainly see it when the paint is dried. So just doing that little bit, you're not looking to get the edge wet. You're not really looking to do much other than run the, the paper over it and lift any sanding dust that you've just created. And that makes a big difference. You should do that any time you're about to, uh, to to paint an edge. Other than that first time, because you know you're going to sand the crap out of it, so it really makes no difference there. When you're actually starting to build the visible finish, like we're going to do on this layer, you want to tack it. And again, it doesn't take much. Just a little bit with the damp towel will we'll do it. And again, you can you can visibly see how much dust that removed. Give this another good shake. I'm actually going to do very, a very pro drying setup here. Caps here. That way we can lay it upright. Don't need it just yet. We're going to add this first here. Paint. Again, I'm going to apply it thicker than I did last time. But same process, using surface tension of holding it on my finger, and rolling it as I move down the edge. I have a nice, pretty, pretty thick bead on that.
shake it up again a little bit just to get some more paint into that cap. Little tiny dirt nib that I can have, but actually, no air bubble. That's actually a little bit of overkill for, for this part because, again, this is just the interior edge of the card slots, so it's very hard to see. But anything worth doing is worth doing right. There's two edges there. I think we're going to let that dry, call it a day, before we wrap it up. Give it a give it a quick look over, make sure they don't have anything running over the edge, which not, everything's just the way it should be. Because again, like I said earlier, it's much easier to clean up when the paint is liquid than when it's dried. But that pretty much does it. So what we did today, we did our two sets of card slots for a fully, uh, fully aligned bifold. I'll probably keep working on this through the week just because I'm really excited to do this. I don't, I don't really want to wait till next week's stream to finish it. I'm sure the customer is excited too. Um, so keep an eye on my Instagram for this. Um, I think this is going to be a very special one when it's all said and done. Certainly a very unique color scheme. I look forward to, uh, to finishing this and, and getting it out into, into the world. I have a couple things that are listed for sale on my storefront right now. I showed them earlier. I have... Um, I'll show them once again before we wrap it up here. I don't think I showed this one. This is the uh, peanut alligator uh, yellow ochre uh, gambetta pocket organizer. So this is available. This is a one-off ready-to-ship item. So this is listed on the uh, on the store page. This is available. I have that up. And then the one I finished last week, if you missed it. Well, nope, nope, that's a customer's order. Ah, here we go. Wrong one. Wrong white box. This guy, this uh, faded blue and white. Lizard skin, double-sided card holder. This is also available. I'm working on getting the made-to-order stuff available to purchase again. We're hoping to get that up by the end of the month. These two are available if you're interested in purchasing something. Those are there. Um, thank you for joining. It was a pleasure. I, I really enjoy doing this, and I, I hope that uh, I covered some things that people wanted to learn. Again, I, I am actively seeking your feedback on both the stream and for things you would like to see covered on here. So if you have any topics that you think would be interesting to do, edge painting, burnishing, things of that nature, or just general ideas, please do let me know. Uh, feel free to leave it in the chat or leave me a comment on, on my profile or an email. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. My Instagram and Facebook are, are also available for leaving feedback, Dreadnought Leather for both. I think we'll call it here. I'm pretty happy with how we did this. Um, uh, again, I, I thank you all for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. Have a good day and, and keep crafting.